Okay, so you're like, this chapter is all about Protus. We haven't even talked about Protus yet. Um, we're going to do a quick overview of some of the major supergroups of the Protestant tree. But let's start out first with what does it mean to be a protist? So that term protist is not a true taxonomic term, okay? It's not a phylogenetic term. It's a term that we use kind of as like, if it's not a plant, animal, or fungi, uh, it's protist. <laughs> so everything else in the eukaryotic tree that's not plant, animal, or fungi, call it a protist. So it's an incredibly wide, diverse, weird group with lots of cool organisms in it. And we unfortunately do not have enough time to give them the due, the due investigation that they are deserving of because protists are super important. They produce more than half of all the oxygen on our planet, right? Like, whoa, everybody loves the rainforest. Nobody really cares about protists, but they're super important. Uh, so let's just do a quick overview. Hopefully this can uh, get exciting for you and trigger some like, ooh, that's interesting moments. Okay, so this is one of my favorite protists. This little guy right here looks like a guy with a little smiley face and those two nuclei. Uh, that is Giardia. <laughs> um, so Giardia is part of the supergroup Excavata. Okay, what's unique about the organisms in this group is that two of the clades in this group, the diplomonads and the parabosalids, do not have functional mitochondria. They have mitochondrial remnants, but they're they're not functional. Okay, so diplomonads and parabosalids tend to be parasitic and they tend to be in, living in anaerobic environments. So like this little guy, Giardia, tends to live in the intestines of a lot of vertebrates and it then sends out copies of itself in the feces and then somebody comes along, drinks contaminated water and you get beaver fever, Giardia. Okay, so that's why we don't drink water that hasn't been purified if you're like out and about and hiking, right? Could get some Giardia. Um, pelvic inflammatory disease is caused by a related protist um, called Trichomonas vaginalis. Again, it's a parasitic organism, lives in anaerobic environments, doesn't really have functional mitochondria. But this clade excavata also includes these cool guys, which hopefully we'll see some in some of our protist samples. Um, these are euglenozoans. So euglenozoans are super cool in the fact that they can both photosynthesize as well as they're both they're heterotrophic as well so we give them that term of mixotrophic and depending on light availability and they have a light an eye spot look at that little red spot right there parts of their cell that is sensitive to light and so they can navigate to light if they find it okay um so euglenozoans really interesting group here but hopefully we'll see some we can watch them wiggle around so the SAR group, SAR, Swinopiles, Alveolates, Rhizozoans, um, that's what that stands for. We kind of group them all together. This is a super important group of protists, like really, really important group of protists. It contains most of the primary producers that are part of the aquatic food chain and produce most of the oxygen on our planet, okay? So they feed their oceans and produce most of the oxygen on our planet. So not to be ignored, these guys. So lots of diversity here in the Schmidopile group. Again, these organisms have chloroplasts that are the result of secondary endosymbiosis for their chloroplasts, right? And one of the other characteristics is that they have two flagella. One of them's kind of hairy. <laughs> We're not quite sure why, but it's kind of cool. Um, so diatoms, which are just gorgeous. It used to be a whole art form in Victorian times of taking diatoms and arranging them under a microscope to make artwork. Diatoms have cell walls made out of silica, so they're basically little glass organisms in a sense. They look like jewels in a way. Um, also in here, then we get kelp. Huge, huge, huge kelp, which creates massive amounts of habitat for especially nurseries. Um, so nurseries are organisms where, nurseries are habitats where juvenile forms will spend their, their lifetime. So really really important part of our ocean ecosystem. So here we have the remaining two groups of SAR, alveolates and rhizaria. Um, so alveolates include two of these groups right here. So this is this is a paramecium. So paramecium is kind of just a general term. There's also organisms that would be different species of paramecium, right? But one of their defining characteristics is that they're covered in these tiny little hairs that we call cilia. And so these hairs are basically extensions of their plasma membrane that they can beat back and forth or move in unison um, to move around. Okay, so they're little tiny critters that kind of zoom around. Hopefully we'll see some of these in our samples as well. Um, the other main big 
group here in the alveolates is these dinoflagellates. Um, so dinoflagellates are often, they often get a bad rap. Um, they're really important just like diatoms and some of the other stromatopods that we talked about as far as being the primary producers of ocean ecosystems. But during a harmful algal bloom or a HAB, um, those harmful algal blooms are often caused by dinoflagellates. So they can often cause, also red tides is another name for them, are often caused by dinoflagellates. They can produce toxins that are neurotoxins that can basically cause seizures and amnesia in mammals. So they can be toxic. But dinoflagellates can also be super cool. So if you've ever seen images of, or videos of like a bioluminescent ocean, the waves of the ocean glowing, that bioluminescence is caused by dinoflagellates in the water. So pretty cool. And then over here, the Rhizarians. This is a these are some weird little critters. Um, these are kind of like amoebas with shells. So they secrete a shell around their around their cell body, um, but then they send out what we call pseudopods, little kind of extensions of their cytoplasm to move around and then trap food. So they're kind of like shelled amoebas is how I like to think about them. So Archaea placida, old placid. So this is a group that have that primary endosymbiosis event, right? This includes red and green algae. So these are all photoautotrophic. So they're all reliant on sunlight for their energy source and they use inorganic carbon. These groups also have reproductive cells that are not flagellated. So they are dependent upon the movement of water for reproduction. Again, just like the diatoms, the dinoflagellates, they are key primary producers in our aquatic ecosystems. So primary producers, again, means that they're the ones feeding the rest of that food chain, the rest of that community, by using solar energy to produce carbohydrates, basically. Um, so we have red algae, here we have some green algae. You may have eaten some red algae if you had some sushi. Sushi is often wrapped in a type of red algae. Okay, so lots of types of algae are edible. We just, in our culture, just don't find them to be something that we seek out as food. Okay, but they are edible, a lot of them. Green algae um, are important because they share a common ancestor with land plants. So all the plants that colonized our land, colonize that different environment of living in the terrestrial environment, they share a common ancestor with green algae. The last major group of protists that we'll talk about is the Uniconta. Um, these are uni meaning one and cont meaning tail. So these are the one tailed protists in a sense. Um, and we're referring to the flagella here. So this is like that quinoflagella that we talked about with multicellularity. So flagella are long whip-like tails that organisms can beat back and forth for movement. There's a couple main branches of the Uniconta here, one first being the amoebas. Um, so amoeba means without form, without shape. So these are the shape changers. They extend their parts of their body and their cytoplasm to kind of move around and trap food. And so they never had the same shape. And then over here, slime molds. Slime molds play a really important role. They're not fungi. They're a different group than fungi, um, but they play a really important role in decomposition in ecosystems. So we actually think that fungi and animals are relatively closely related to this guy down here, the epistocont. Um, this is very similar to what we saw with the uh, kind of flagellate, right? And even though this looks more like a fungi, fungi are more closely related to animals, us, than they would be to the slime molds. So we think that we actually share a common ancestor with fungi. Kind of very, that was very similar to this epistocont here, right? To this uh, kind of flagellate like organism. So those are three main groups, amoeba, epistocon, and the slime molds for the uniconda.